hold it. All righty. Um, I have the kind of pleasure of going so much later, so I can kind of like riff off everybody, but it's also uh, made me rethink my talk quite a bit. So <laughs> try and stay on script as uh, well as possible. Um, I uh, took a leave of absence from UC a few years ago to go back to graduate school. And um, it just so happened that COVID started kind of right into my first year there. So uh, I did a bunch of reading and I had a bunch of free time and I took a bunch of baths. So here's a picture of a book that I found really inspiring while reading, um, while reading in the bath. Uh, and this is from Wendell Berry. Um, and I found this quote really kind of intriguing and it kind of kick-started, what ended up being my thesis. Uh, the standard of the exploiter is efficiency. efficiency. The standard of the nurturer is care. And I found that really interesting that here's this guy who's a farmer, a social critic, um, a poet, and he's put this like kind of a uh, stake in the sand about these two kind of opposed things that I don't necessarily feel like are necessarily opposed. So first and foremost, I think of myself as a furniture designer. Um, I teach industrial design at UC. That kind of takes the form of furniture design oftentimes. But my fascination with furniture design is less about the object and more about the fact that chairs and most furniture is relatively figured out. So I can kind of explore other things within it. So if I want to design a chair, I know that following a few basic kind of like formulas and measurements, and I can make something that's pretty comfortable. So I can kind of explore other topics within it. Um, and I work a lot in wood. Um, I used to work in steel. I found that wood kind of has this infinite knowledge base. So it's this kind of like perpetually challenging thing. I'm always learning. Um, and uh, if you work in wood, you just work with light. Um, trees got there from light, right? Um, and as a chair maker, which I would kind of aspire to consider myself a chair maker, we'll see if I ever get to the point where I feel comfortable calling myself that. Um, but uh, really boring, really straight trees are the ones you want, right? And we're making a tabletop. We oftentimes want figure and some wood with kind of character. That makes for a really difficult log to work within woodworking. And uh, I take walks out from into uh, Parker Woods fairly often, which is in Northside. And there's this valley that has tulip poplars coming up that are dead straight. Tulip poplars, not great chair wood, but uh, it's pretty interesting to see some of these trees that are dead straight and for 50 feet don't have a single branch. Um, and, and that's them racing to the sun in trying to get some light. Uh, and it's also, they're straight because they're protected from other trees from the wind and other things like that. So that makes for really good chair lumber in general. Um, and during school, I found these two books to be really fascinating. Uh, the Toaster Project is kind of in, amongst design academic circles, really intriguing. Um, this guy, Thomas Thwaites, his thesis uh, in graduate school was trying to make a toaster entirely from scratch. So he was gonna mine his own ore, he uh, made, made his own um, mica, things of that nature, and that ended up being the toaster he made. And uh, his undergraduate degree was in macroeconomics, I believe. And the intent was to kind of prove how complicated the systems become, that um, oftentimes individuals could make an entire product of their own 150 years ago, and now something as mundane as a $15 toaster is impossible to make on your own. Um, countered with this uh, book by Jenny Alexander, Make a Chair from a Tree. And Jenny Alexander dedicated a significant portion of her life to basically just refining the design of this tree, or of this chair, to be used with as few tools as possible. So she basically wrote this textbook on how to copy this tree um, with as few tools and as little experience as possible. Um, and the thing I find really intriguing is that like, the Toaster Project is him taking on a project that he knows is impossible. Um, and make a chair from a tree is this is her taking dedicating her entire life to this project in which she accomplished really early on and it was just like this constant iteration of refinement um so uh COVID had started i suddenly had a bunch of free time because i didn't have to go to class any longer um and i was kind of dabbling with what is efficiency and anyhow so i decided to take on this uh, challenge of making a chair using the least amount of energy i could possibly consume um and I define chair as a few kind of things. It needs to be ergonomic in some respect. It can't just be a log and weigh 60 pounds. It needs to be movable. Um, and uh, so this ended up being the final result. Um, I charted everything with an iPhone, which is a little weird because it's drawing energy on its own, but I kind of tried to forget that. Um, so every time I was working on it, I made sure I was wearing my Apple Watch and kind of recording things in some way. And 
I, this is very like loose science, we'll say. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I was new to Rhode Island, so trying to find a tree was kind of tricky. Um, so I found this guy who would cut down these red oak trees in his yard. Because they weren't from a forest, they were in his yard, they didn't make for great chair making wood because they weren't dead straight. But um, I uh, crafted this thing to tow behind my bicycle because the first, the kind of first rule was like the second I use my car, I'm already like going through energy like crazy, right? So um, I towed this thing behind my bicycle in which I could like process the log in situ um, so that I wasn't trying to pull back 300 pounds back to my house. Um, the closest log I could find was eight miles away. So uh, I processed the log in this guy's yard. He found it really weird, but um, he was originally going to charge me. He was going to charge me 100 bucks, which I was totally cool with. Uh, and then he found it so entertaining that he didn't charge me, <laughs> which, is kind of, which is nice. So I processed the, this thing over one day. This was October. It just happened to be this amazing day in October. Um, and I knocked it down into kind of more manageable parts. When you're working with from a log, you can't take things to final dimension because they're going to shrink so much as they dry out. So I roughed them out to like kind of something that was more manageable. Four round trips back to my house uh, that day to try and kind of move the material. And um, I had this like issue that I couldn't get over. And I find a, in, in ergonomic, one of the rules of er ergonomic chairs is that the backrest should kind of conform to your body in some way. And that's usually achieved by steam bending. That kind of presents the challenge of how do I generate steam without using a ton of energy? And I kind of created this hack by thinking that if I took the scraps of wood and I turned them into biochar, I could take heat from that, which is obviously energy that I'm not able to calculate, but I'm able to capture some of the carbon in those tree in those chips that would have otherwise turned possibly to methane in kind of a worse scenario. So I've kind of found it this like workaround that's kind of cheap. Um, so here's my setup. So I've got this little biochar stove down in the left corner. That's boiling a can of water. Um, and my parts, and well, it's actually already been taken out. So you can see this like kind of U is the backrest. Um, so I charted all the things out, the days that I kind of burnt the most calories and everything, um, and kind of my inputs on all of these things and all of the steps. Um, I didn't use electricity, so I used kind of bit and brace. Um, and I ended up burning 10,666 calories. Um, I calculated that if I had driven my car to this guy's house one time and back, it would have been over double that. Um, so uh, obviously a lot of time spent. Um, here's a little, you know, also crude science, I guess. Um, and the kind of the steps walking through it. Um, and there's the final chair in front of my bicycle. Uh, one of the challenges I was, looking for seat material, I found um, that I could use uh, cattail leaves. And cattails weave really nicely. Kind of interestingly, relative to light, if you let them dry in the dark, they'll stay really pliable. If, you, if they dry in the sun, they'll be really brittle and white and crumbly. So I kind of built this thing and put it up in the roof of my garage so it kind of stayed dark and uh, weave the cattail leaves from there. And so interestingly, kind of, it, when I started the project, I was planning on having a chair. And when I ended the project, I had a chair and biochar, um, which was this kind of weird thing that opened up this whole new door to me. And it was the first time that I had ever like uh, done something that I felt like I knew was good. If that makes sense. Like I'm not a vegan. I know if you're a vegan, that's good. But I can't, I'm not a vegan. I can't. <laughs> but, um, but I like pick up this biochar that I made. And it was like, whoa, this is like carbon that would have been released from the atmosphere under normal conditions, supposedly. Um, so that took me down a whole path. Um, and because I'd used bio, I'd generated biochar to boil water, which isn't that much energy. Um, and I happened to meet, meet a ceramicist um, the next semester in school, and we were looking to kind of partner on some sort of project. Um, so my kind of question I asked is, can we bisque fire a cup and make biochar same, simultaneously in the same kiln? Um, so no longer boiling water, but now trying to reach, you know, thousands of degrees to bisque fire ceramic. Um, so I took a trip to Home Depot and I love these kind of like kit bashing things on the floor of Home Depot and trying to figure out. So I bought a trash can, you know, I'm basically scaling up my previous stove. Um, and, uh, especially soft science is as you're making biochar and I find this like this really weirdly transformative thing. It's like you're releasing light that was captured by the tree. Right? It's kind of interesting. Um, so uh, 
the, the basics of the stove is you light it from the top, from the very top of the flame, and it creates a draft and pulls it through. And you're actually burning the uh, volatilized gases out of the wood rather than burning the wood itself, and you're left with carbon um, as long as you extinguish it in time. I discovered that like anything zinc's gonna melt, so that's kind of what that is. So in the middle of this thing being fired, it fell over because the hardware holding it together melted away. Um, one of the challenges with uh, Ceramic firing is that you can't just go up to temperature right away. Your part's going to explode. So I had to figure out some way of like reaching temperature slowly. Um, so that's what this is happening is I'm trying to divert the flame. The ceramic piece is actually in this bucket on top, trying to divert the flame away from it rather than straight up to it. Um, and then as we kind of reach temperature, I could close this damper a little bit and redirect the flame a little bit. Um, and uh, this is all in my backyard, so it was a little sketchy. Um, and I had just gotten this dog. <laughs> so he was destroying my yard during it. And this is kind of walk around this thing. Um, and uh, so through this, one of the things that we found is like somehow, and Miguel is an expert in ceramics. He fires kilns for people for a job and things. And uh, he couldn't figure out how he possibly had bisque fired this cup using so little material. Um, that's still kind of a mystery. I presented this at a ceramics conference a few weeks ago, and they kind of felt the same way, like, how did this work? So I don't, I don't know anything about ceramic. <laughs> but it, so that's kind of the design of the thing. Um, this is it in operation. You can see I melted a bucket at some point. The way we would kind of, uh, the way we would kind of turn, the, get the biochar is we'd take it out and extinguish it in water. Um, because if you just let it go, it'll eventually turn to ash. Um, and so we made this little cup. And that turned into, when I came back to UC, um, I met up with a colleague, Matt Wazinski, and um, we started working on these projects. And I'm not going to share too much about this because it's still kind of super in, uh, in progress. But um, sort of working on these projects like sharing this knowledge with other people. Um, so the first workshop we ran is making a copy of my original um, biochar stove. Um, and these are designs that are that I found on YouTube, um, but I've tweaked them mostly around parts that are easier to find. Uh, mostly, we had eight people come together and make these little biochar stoves. We ended up cooking over top of them, um, and I found that like one of the things, especially after watching everybody else's presentations, like why you know these these projects happen to resonate with me really well, um, and I think one of the reasons is because I was able to do them outside. Um, even as a woodworker, I'm usually working inside. I'm working in a shop. Um, and uh, during COVID, I had a backyard, and I'm just, like, working, tinkering away in my backyard outside. And it's, like, this super memorable uh, time that, like, I'm sure is some way related to my exposure to light during that time. I'm very pale, so I probably got too much exposure to light. Um, but here's more Home Depot, or this time Lowe's. <laughs> And so the next workshop we ran, uh, this one's still kind of in progress because I'm waiting for my uh, lettuce to finish germinating. Um, so this is a uh, vertical grow tower, same thing. So we're like taking things from YouTube uh, that are almost incomplete in a sense in trying to figure out ways of turning them into something more uh, replicable. Um, and uh, interestingly, kind of to the vertical farm situation, uh, because it's gonna be my house, it's just kind of like drawing from power that I'm already kind of putting out. Um, and so my questions are, are care and efficiency actually in contrast with one another? And uh, I found, and I think some of the people discussing this have kind of gotten to this point of like, in my perspective, true efficiency is caring. And we've just gotten to this point where we decide not to measure the things that make us seem less efficient. Um, and maybe like LEDs being one of them is like thinking for the longest time, like, oh, these, work, these old lights work great. Well, that's when we're not considering how much energy they're consuming. But the second you think of energy, they're not very efficient any longer. Um, and so I would argue that they rely totally on one another. And then also, uh, thinking through this, um, should we be just rethinking our work life around our need for the outdoors? Um, could this conference or this working group be outside? Or could I be working outside basically all the time? And we discuss a little bit kind of during lunch. Uh, is it an architecture problem? I would say maybe it's more of a social problem. So, thank you. Oh, cool. 
Okay. Yeah, totally. Totally. Thank you so much.